Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. This is Russ Barkley and in this brief commentary I want to speak about the overlap or linkage of ADHD with substance use disorders, uh, what the risks are, and what this overlap might mean for the diagnosis and management of ADHD when it occurs with a substance use disorder. In part one, we're going to talk about what these risks are and how they, uh, or why this increased risk exists, excuse me, and what the risks actually are. And then in part two, a separate video, I'm going to discuss what this means for diagnosis and management. So let's move on. Why would ADHD predispose people to substance use and abuse, or, or generally to making poorer life choices than other people without ADHD are less likely to do? Well, first of all, we know that ADHD isn't just an attention disorder. There's no way that you could link up inattentiveness with substance use problems in any coherent or straightforward way. Uh, we also know that ADHD is more than just a disorder of inhibition. Uh, again, it would be difficult to explain the problems with substance use purely as a result of impulsivity, although to some extent that is involved in experimenting with illegal or other substances. Instead, ADHD is really a disorder of self-regulation. And when we understand that, we can see why someone who has trouble with self-regulation would fall prey to a variety of forms of addictive behavior as a result of being more controlled by momentary consequences around them than are other people who are more regulated by the longer term consequences of what they are thinking of doing. So it really is this distinction between the short term thinking of the person with ADHD and the longer term thinking of others who contemplate what may happen to them when they make certain life choices. So we know that this problem with self-regulation as I've explained in my other videos, arises as a result of problems with the brain's executive functions uh, and networks. And we know that self-regulation permits us to anticipate the likely future events that will happen based on the choices we make, and it allows us to organize our behavior over time toward those future events, toward those future choices that we're making in order to improve our longer term welfare. And therefore, people with ADHD suffer from difficulties with this kind of self-regulation over time toward the future. And therefore, instead of maximizing their longer term outcomes, they instead make choices that simply maximize the more immediate consequences in their life. This makes them appear more reward seeking, more sensation seeking, uh, and as someone who gives less credence or contemplation to what could happen to them if they make these kinds of short-term choices. And in my other lectures, I've shown you this diagram of how, as people develop, they learn to anticipate and are capable of anticipating the future further and further ahead and contemplating events within that window on time, and that people with ADHD have a much more truncated window on time, and therefore are not thinking as far ahead as others, and demonstrate a sort of time blindness, as I call it, to these future events that others would understand are associated with the choices that we're making, but people with ADHD don't seem to think that much about or at least give much credence to. And as I've said, that leaves people with ADHD to have a very high time preference, to prefer smaller immediate rewards over longer term and larger rewards. And all of that helps us to see then why throughout the hundreds of daily life choices that we have to make between the now and the later, people with ADHD are making more choices within the now to maximize the now that are not going to be good 
for their longer term welfare. It helps us to understand the relationship between ADHD and certain personality traits, especially conscientiousness, which is this ability to give consideration to the longer term outcomes of our choices, not only for us, but for others who may be involved in our lives. So all of this then tells us that the person with ADHD is going to be more addiction prone because they're more susceptible to being captured by all of these offerings of momentary rewards, of risk seeking, of sensation seeking. They're going to be more captivated by those opportunities than are people who have better self-regulation and who are better able to contemplate not just what happens now, but what could happen eventually if I keep choosing to behave in this manner. So ADHD is biasing decision-making in each of these daily choices toward optimizing the moment and smaller consequences over optimizing the later and the larger consequences in life. Such impulsive decision-making that occurs many times a day over days and weeks and months has to have a cumulative impact on the individual's risks for impairment in a variety of life situations uh, and including choices that we make about the various substances we wish to experiment with and in some cases can make a singular impact on our risk for injury, suicide and accidental death that can occasionally result from these very impulsive risk-taking life choices. Thus, ADHD is predisposing people to a lot more adverse consequences in life in nearly every domain of life, and that would include choices that are made around using or not using substances that may be available to you in your immediate environment. So we can then see that ADHD increases the risk for substance experimentation, use, and abuse, what are called SUDS, abbreviated as substance use disorders. So by itself, we know that ADHD increases the risk for starting substance experimentation, starting it earlier than other people do, increasing their use of a substance more rapidly than other people do who might experiment with that substance, that they are more likely to go on to use that substance to excess to the point where they develop a, a dependency addiction or use or abuse disorder and therefore get a diagnosis of that, that they are more, have more likely difficulties adhering to and succeeding in substance abuse treatment programs. They won't do as well in them because they don't adhere to the rehabilitation efforts in those programs the way other people might. They're also more likely to relapse following their treatment for substance use disorders, uh, again, because of their ADHD characteristics and poor self-regulation. These risks can be reduced if the person with ADHD is being treated and especially being treated with medication. But absent treatment, people with ADHD in general carry much higher risks for these kinds of substance experimentation and use problems. We know that ADHD alone predisposes toward excessive use of caffeine. Uh, that is less definite, but it does appear to be especially in young late adolescent males, that they're more likely to use alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. Now, if they have ADHD with another disorder like conduct disorder, it may increase their likelihood of abusing worse substances than these. But ADHD alone contributes to risk for these kinds of substance use and abuse problems. The risk for using these drugs increases with age through adolescence and adulthood as people become uh, more exposed to and have more opportunities to engage in interacting with these substances. And we see that the disparity between ADHD and more typical youth increases over time because as people become young adults, they may start to decrease their use of substances like nicotine 
like marijuana. But in this case, the individual with ADHD may continue in this pathway of substance use and abuse. So, so by adulthood, there is a striking difference in the occurrence of substance use between ADHD individuals and typical individuals that maybe was not so evident when they were young teens. That risk is growing over time, such that by adulthood, about 20 to 30 percent of childhood cases of ADHD will qualify for a substance dependence or abuse disorder. Uh, and we also know, conversely, that a substantial percentage of people who go to substance use programs are also more likely to have ADHD. In some cases, that's about 9 or 10 percent. In other forms of substance use programs, it's as high as 25 to 40 percent, uh, such as for cocaine abusers. So we can see then that both ADHD predisposes to substance use problems and people with substance use problems may be more likely to have ADHD. ADHD cases that have substance use problems often have worse ADHD symptoms. To some extent, that's a result of the fact that the more severe your ADHD, the more likely you drift to substance use. But it can also be the substance abuse feeding back to worsen the underlying problems with self-regulation, attention, inhibition, and so on. And we know that their functional outcomes later in adulthood are worse if they have this comorbidity of ADHD with SUDS than if they did not. We can therefore see that ADHD alone predisposes to problems with substance use, but link it up with conduct disorder or antisocial personality, and it can make the substance use problems much, much worse. The person is likely to be using a wider variety of illegal substances than would be the case if they had ADHD alone. Over time, antisocial activities increase the likelihood of substance use and abuse, and substance use and abuse feeds forward to increase the likelihood of further antisocial activities, such as lying, stealing to get money for drugs, uh, and selling drugs, possessing illegal drugs, and so on. So there is sort of a reciprocal interaction going on between antisocial behavior and substance use problems that worsens each other over time. When we study these two in people with ADHD, and obviously all of this has a negative impact on risk of early death and shorter life expectancy. Now, the greater risk of substance use disorders is not related to taking stimulant medication in childhood. I have another brief commentary on that particular uh, question. Uh, and as you see in that commentary, the research uniformly shows that stimulant treatment in childhood is not increasing risk for substance use problems in adolescence or adulthood. Now, we know that there are multiple factors that are linked up with substance use problems, uh, and you see them listed over here on the left-hand side of the diagram. And we know that all of these, in various ways, contribute to both substance use problems and to the risk of other antisocial activities. But let's take a look at how these might interact with each other, given what we know in the research. We know that ADHD and its executive deficits can have an adverse impact on one's intelligence. And I have a video on that. Even though the relationship is a bit small, the relationship is one of an adverse effect. We know that both of those risk factors are likely to contribute to poorer academic accomplishment and achievement in school, and that all three of those are now going to interact to result in less eventual education in one's life. And we know that all of that then is going to predispose individuals over to lives of antisocial activity and substance use. Why is that? Because we know that people with lower educational attainments are more likely 
to find themselves affiliating with deviant peers, antisocial peers, and are more likely to be rejected by more pro-social, uh, more typical, and more academically accomplished peers. So all of these then are going to be predisposing factors that nudge people further and further over to these kinds of activities, antisocial behavior and substance use problems. Now, in addition to that, we know that a subset of people with ADHD, it might be one in 10, also has the traits of psychopathic personality, what we call the callous, unemotional traits, lack of conscientiousness, lack of guilt, lack of remorse and concern with others, and rather callous toward the uh, things, the adverse things that may happen to other people. That also contributes to deviant peer affiliations and then to these outcomes over here. We know that people who use substances are more likely to come from families with increased substance use. And so we see that parental ADHD is likely to occur in these ADHD cases because of the genetics of the disorder. And we know that parental ADHD will also be predisposing parents towards substance use problems. And that combination then can model substance use behavior in an adverse way to increase the likelihood that the ADHD offspring of these parents may be more likely as well to use substances. We also know that the parents' ADHD and substance use problems lead them to monitor their children and teens less and therefore giving their teens a greater opportunity out in public to affiliate with deviant peers, experiment with substances, and engage in antisocial activity. And we also know that these kinds of parental traits might increase the risk of childhood adverse experiences, including perhaps childhood maltreatment. And of course, all of these then feed back to, once more, greater likelihood of peer rejection and therefore of affiliating with antisocial drug using peers. And as I've said, by the time we get over here to these outcomes, they begin to interact and worsen each other in kind of a snowballing effect. Uh, and therefore, when one occurs, the other becomes more likely. And as that becomes more likely, it feeds back to worsen the initial condition. So there's a reciprocal worsening over time. This linkage of ADHD to substance use problems can be made worse by comorbid anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder as well. And finally, recent studies show that the genes for ADHD are also risk genes. That is, they convey a liability for alcoholism and nicotine use. So in some cases, the risk of substance use and abuse is being driven by the underlying genetics of ADHD with certain substances. So I hope that shows you why ADHD individuals may have an increased risk for substance use problems and what those substance use difficulties are likely to be. In the next video, I'm going to talk with you about the implications of all of this for the diagnosis and management of ADHD and substance use problems. Thanks for joining me.